Today we're finishing, or continuing rather, our series in Daniel. If you brought a Bible, I encourage you to open up to Daniel chapter 7. We're calling this series Coming King. We're going to be in Daniel 7 verses 9 through 14. Before you turn there, or as you turn there, by way of introduction, you know, it's like I noticed I see some um, football jerseys in the audience. I see the Packer jersey out there. Go Pack Go. They're going to beat the Dallas Cowboys today. So I'm a big sports fan. We're in championship season. The, the Michigan Wolverines beat Washington Huskies. Wah, wah, wah. Uh, uh, last weekend for the national championship. And now this weekend launches, uh, if you're an NFL fan, launches the whole wild card weekend and the playoffs start. And it's very exciting. Last Sunday, the Green Bay Packers ha- had like a win and in sort of scenario if they beat the 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 Chicago Bears in Green Bay, they would make it into the playoffs. And so my family and I got to watch the game being true uh, Packer fans and they won and it's very exciting. And I was excited about the whole win. And so I decided I just kind of want to revel in that. And so I go on YouTube. I don't have cable or anything. And so I go on YouTube and I just start, you know, Google searching. What are the talking heads on sports channels saying about the Green Bay Packers? And I'm just listening. And, and oh my, have you ever delved into that world? Uh, I, go into, I go into YouTube and I'm kind of just wanting to search for like, uh, you know, just, I just want to have, I just want to feel good and positive about the Packers making it to the playoffs, how they're going to beat the, the Cowboys today. But as I, as I listen, I'm seeing all these TV shows, right, where there are these ex-players and ex-coaches and these sports journalists and these fans and for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours ad nauseum, these people speak and analyze, and speculate, and ponder, and wonder, and they look at all these different sports teams, and franchises, and, and matchups from all these different angles, and it's insane to me, and it's like they're all, they're all just kind of speculating on who's going to win this Sunday, but who's going to win the big game on February uh, 11th, and they just, I mean, and, well, this team is peaking at the right time, this team has the right defense, this team's quarterback is, is really struggling right now, and it's just like I'm listening to these guys speculate and talk, and there are so many opinions. None of the opinions are the same. All of the opinions have some valid reasoning, exception of a few. But what I, re- what I realize is I'm watching all these guys. They all have opinions and all of them need a life. Like, oh my goodness. Like, <laughs> really? Like, uh, thousands of hours of this. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, we're playing this, this Sunday. You're going to know. <laughs> just, just wait. You'll figure out what's going to happen. All this talking for what? The Super Bowl's in four weeks. The world's going to know who the world champion is on February 11th. I, I share all this with you because as we entered the part, of, the part of Daniel that we're in where we're talking about eschatology or end times, the study of the, of the end, the study of end times and how the Bible uniquely sort of reveals to us what, what, what awaits the people of God, what awaits the world as, as the world marches towards the consummation of the kingdom. As I, as I think about what we're studying in Daniel chapter 7, it's like those YouTube channels. There are so many people talking and there are so many opinions about how to interpret the verses we're going to be in today. And so many, so many opinions, and honestly many of them are very va- value, uh, and they are they're valid points, valid opinions. But I, I'm, I'm here to tell you that no one agrees. I brought with me three of the resources I've been using in this, in this series. These are written by scholars, scholar theologians, uh, uh, Golden Gay, Helm, and Miller, right? And, and, and this guy reads Daniel 7 in one way. This guy reads Daniel 7 in a different way. And this guy reads Daniel 7 in another different way. And they don't agree. And they all have PhDs in this stuff. And I'm thinking, what hope do I have? As I'm reading these guys, I'm telling you, there's just nobody agrees on, on the details of Daniel 7. We're going to get into some of the details today. We need to get into the details, and I'll help you see where there's lack of agreement. They have different views. And I, and I, and I, and I take up Daniel chapter 7. I shared last week how humbling it is each and every week to be able to teach up here before our church. But it's even especially humbling when we're to undertaking a text where there's not really agreement within the body of Christ. These are good men and women who have different views on how to interpret these scriptures. They love Jesus and, and solid Bible-believing Christians have different interpretations of some of the details of this text. And so there's a part of me that would love to be smart enough to be able to explain all the nuanced views to you. Then I realize I'm not, a, I'm not an Old Testament prof. That's not my job. Thank God there are Old Testament professors. We need those men and women in our lives. They're very important in in the, our models of discipleship. They're very important that we learn these sorts of things. But I realize as we gather as a church on a Sunday morning, as we're sitting under the word preached, my job at the end of the day is persuasion. 
And so it's to teach that the truth of God's word as it's revealed to us in Daniel 7, that it might persuade us, woo us into worship, into obedience, into walking as God would have us walk. And so as I thought about that this week, I thought about who's going to be in the congregation on Sunday. Who's going to be here? There, there are you here today, and I know you're here because our church is loaded with just people who are students of the word. There, there are some of you here today are so geeked out by eschatology. You named your cat Eska and your dog Tology. Like, this is your thing. Like, this is what you do. And I, I, honestly, I am so grateful for, for those of you that are students of, of, of prophetic, the prophetic literature, the apocalyptic literature. It's awesome. And, you, and your YouTube channels are all the people that teach on, on prophecy and on end time stuff. And you have a very strong view on how you interpret these scriptures. Awesome. So glad you're here. And, and we need you in the body of Christ. And, and I can learn from you, no doubt. And I know that there are people here today who are saying, Eska what? What are you talking about? Like, end times? Like, I know that, but what's eschatology? Well, it's this Greek word, meaning es- eschatology, which means the end of, like, and, and you're saying, I, I came to church because I want to worship. I, I'm pursuing, and I want to know who this God is, and I'm here today to encounter the living God. And, and, and if eschatology is a part of God's word, like, I want to understand that so I can know him more, but like, you start putting charts up on the, up on the screen, like, I'm lost, bro. There's, there's those of you, and there's everyone who's in different places in between. There was a time I was in Camp One, um, and I've just been humbled over the years, because largely because I interact with people that are brilliant, who love Jesus, who know the Word, and they just challenge my thinking. And I realized, you know what? I can't be so dogged in my understanding of these passages. It's just not humble, and I want to be, I want to be receptive. I want to learn. I want to, I want to hold on to what we need to hold on to. There's unwavering things we can never let go of, and there's some things within the body of Christ, where we can have disagreement, and it's not a reason to divide or fight. We just sharpen each other as we figure out what we believe about certain things. And a lot of what we're going to talk about today fits in that category. If you're here last week, as we looked at the first eight verses of Daniel chapter 7, and these eight, or these four ghastly beasts that rose out of the churning seas of chaos, we, we saw that uh, God is bigger than the beasts. As Daniel was given this vision, we, we concluded by saying that God controls the very things that actively rise in opposition to him. And this week, as we turn our focus to verses 9 through 14, there's lots of things we're going to understand here today, but here's the main thing I think you should write down or you should kind of just put in your heart this morning as we journey through this text. And it's simply this. Justice is assured and salvation is coming. Here's, I think, the primary argument of what I'm going to kind of try to help us see today as we journey through these few verses is that justice, ultimate justice, divine justice, definitive justice is assured and salvation is promised for the people of God. And I think we see that in our passage today. God's ultimate and exhaustive justice. So last week, if you were here, we stepped into Daniel 7. Uh, uh, Daniel 1 through 6, we studied in the fall and and early, early winter. And we saw some of these great bedtime stories in the first half of Daniel about lion's dens and fiery furnaces furnaces and and the like. And if the first half of Daniel is about bedtime stories, uh, the, the second half of Daniel is a night at the movies. It's apocalyptic literature, and these movies are horror films. And apocalyptic literature, which begins here in Daniel 7, works in images and pictures and scenes, and we see that unfolding as we journey through this book. And, and we talk, talked about some of this last week. Again, I want to do a brief orientation on, like, okay, this is apocalyptic literature. It was narrative in the first six verses, and now as we get into the second half of Daniel, it's, a, it's apocalypse. So what is that? Well, what is apocalyptic literature? Well, we answered this last week, but let me answer it again to you. This is not just a telling of the future that's contained in Daniel 7 through 12. It's a pulling back of the curtain, like I said last week. Apocalypse is an unveiling, it's a revealing, it's a revelation of the unseen spiritual reality behind earthly events. It's God giving Daniel his eyes to see the spiritual realities behind earthly things. And so as we read this kind of literature, we see that it's got unique ways in which it communicates. Apocalyptic literature, it it communicates using pictures like a movie. And these pictures, these images, they contain ghastly figures and it uses uh, symbolism in dramatic ways. Uh, Apocalyptic literature leans heavily on metaphor and it ultimately highlights cataclysmic events that will signal the end of the world and the ushering in of God's new world after final judgment. And 
And the rules that apply in reading apocalyptic literature are different than the tools we use in reading other kinds of literature, whether it be discourse or poetry or wisdom or narrative. We recognize as we read these words, and we're going to read them here in a minute, that there's symbolism at play here. We've got to understand that and interpret it as such. We've got to recognize that the vantage point in apocalyptic literature is not a human being looking at things from a human perspective along a chronological timeline. Apocalyptic literature rises us up out of that, and we're looking at things from God's vantage point, which is different. And we see that there are other devices at play that we'll uncover as we journey through this last six chapters of Daniel and so then the question is, is this simply. I, I've been asking this question a lot. Like, okay, then why did, God, why did you put it in Scripture? If nobody agrees on the nuance or the little things here, if it's confusing to us to read today and it's challenging, and many people I know in their Bible reading plans, they get to Apocalypse, they're like, nope, 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 nope. Okay, back to something else I want to read. If that's the case, then why did God put this in the Scriptures for us? If this is his word for us, why? Well, I, I, I can speculate a couple reasons. One, it's God reminding us that he alone is the author of history. As he peels back the veil and allows Daniel to see the spiritual reality behind historical events, we recognize that it's God who's behind the, the things that are unfolding as history unfolds. He is a sovereign God. And we're also reminded that he holds our future and the future in his hands. And I said this last week, almost in passing. I had a conversation with a friend this week, and, and he said, I love that you said that. I wish you would have explained a little bit more. Apocalyptic literature, many have called it pastoral. What do I mean by that? Well, as we read these, these, these difficult texts, we're reminded that God is the God of history. God is the God who is sovereign over all things. And we're reminded, as he's gazing in and seeing all things, that he is present with us. He is the good shepherd who walks with us through the most terrifying of scenes. The good shepherd who walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death. When we read Apocalypse, we're reminded that God is with us. He is present with us. And that is pastoral. And it's meant, ultimately, this genre of scripture is meant to provide hope to the people of God. As we read this, it's not to have all the answers and figure out all the charts and know all the interesting things and how it connects to current events. So that's part of it. The, the purpose of this literature is to encourage you and me as the people of God to persevere. To hold on in the most terrifying of circumstances, despite the terrors of the world, to hold on because we ultimately know how history ends and who the victor is. We know who wins the game. Amen? So we were introduced to this literature last week. Looked at the first eight verses. We saw these ghastly beasts as Daniel was given a vision uh, of wind and water, the winds of heaven blew across the chaotic seas of chaos as they churned, and these four ghastly beasts emerged from the water as Daniel watched, and one looked like a lion with some wings, and one looked like a bear with, that was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth, and the third beast looked like a leopard, but it had four wings and four heads, weird stuff. And then there was this fourth beast that wasn't likened to any animal, but it had ten horns, and then an eleventh horn sprung up, and it was speaking great things, and it was, uh, had, the, had the eyes of a man. So interesting. And then we ended. So that was fun. And uh, we finished the sermon with that last week, and we saw again that, that God is bigger than the beasts, and he controls the very things that actively arise in opposition to him. And that's where we pick up. We left off last week in verse 8 where we see this little horn that we find out later is resembling a, a king in a kingdom. We see this little horn that, that, that comes up out of among the other horns and, and before which three of the first horns were plucked up by their roots. And behold, this little horn, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. This tyrannical kingdom with this tyrannical king is speaking great things. And then we pick up today. Daniel 7, beginning in verse 9. The scene shifts dramatically as we start reading. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery furnace, his throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. The stream of fire, a stream of fire, issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. Verse 11. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. 
And as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed, and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for several seasons and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom and all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Father, we need your help today. As we read these words, we need your help to understand, to hear, to see what it is you want us to understand and to hear and to see. Holy Spirit, we need you at work in our lives, softening our hearts, providing illumination, giving us understanding, bringing conviction, empowering and enabling us to walk in obedience. God, as we read these words as unique and as apocalyptic as they are, we know that there is truth here for us today. So would you help us to see that truth and respond in that truth? And would you be glorified in our midst as we do? God, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we know that all of what Daniel is seeing is symbolic. Next week we'll get up and we'll, we'll, we'll teach the rest of the chapter next week, verse 15 to verse 28. And in verse 15, after he comes out of this vision, Daniel's like, what did I just see? <laughs> that was terrifying. And he goes to an interpreter, an angel, and the angel provides interpretation and tells him, oh, these beasts are kingdoms, and these, this horn is a king. And he, he begins to recognize this is symbolic. This is one of the natures of apocalypse. This is symbolic imagery for us. Daniel's told by this interpreter that these ghastly beasts are symbolic of future earthly kings in their kingdoms. And so last week, if you were here, I made an argument that these four beasts were a recapitulation of what we see in Daniel chapter 2. That's one of the things that we see that's unique to apocalyptic literature is recapitulation. That's kind of a fancy word. What that simply means is this. You're going to watch football today, right? Right? And so, so when uh, Jordan Love throws like an 85-yard touchdown pass to beat the Cowboys and make it to the next round, uh, you're going to watch as Jordan Love throws a pass and, and, he's, and this guy's going to catch it and you're going to see one angle. And you're going to be like, yes, I saw that. And then for the next... Three and a half minutes, you're going to see nine other angles of that touchdown. You're going to see it from the pylon cam. You're going to see it from the camera that hangs up in the cables. You're going to see it from the end zone. You're going to see it from the field. And you're going to see the same event from seven or eight different angles. So you get a better understanding of what that event was. The idea of recapitulation in apocalyptic literature is that. Is that there is something God wants us to see about his reality, about the future, about what he's doing. And so recapitulation within Apocalypse gives us different perspectives of the same event so that we more fully understand it. So back in Daniel chapter 2, if you remember, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And in the dream there was this colossus, this, this nine, or this, 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 this statue filled of, with four different metals. And the head was gold, the, 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 the arms were silver, the, the torso was bronze, and the legs were iron with the feet mixed with iron and clay. And this stone cut from no human hand came flinging in and obliterates the statue. It blows away like chaff. And this stone that comes in becomes a mountain and fills the whole earth. Well, I made the argument last week that what we see in Daniel 7 is a recapitulation of what we saw in Daniel chapter 2. We're seeing a different angle of these four kingdoms. And so the argument was that these kingdoms that Daniel is seeing through these beasts were future to him, but are past for us. I argued that the, the, the golden head of the statue was analogous to the lion in the, the vision here in Daniel 7, which was reflective of the Babylonian Empire. And then successively we saw that the, the next, the, the, the silver arms and the, the bear was the Medo-Persian Empire and the, the, the torso that was bronze was analogous to the Greek Empire and the iron legs was reflective of, uh, and this fourth beast with all the horns was reflective of the Roman Empire. So that was an argument that I made. At the same time, I wish I'd had more time last week to talk about that this kind of biblical literature is unique, right? So we've got to be careful in too rigid of interpretation. In this kind of literature, language consistently collapses on one period of time in history upon another. Which means that as we read and interpret apocalyptic literature, 
we need to be aware that images and symbols that we see in these pages can often apply to more than one period of time in history. I've heard authors call this an elasticity. One author says this elasticity of this kind of scripture has been called, some call it transhistorical. One author calls it transtemporal. What does that mean? He says this, this literature is transtemporal. It means that, that what Daniel saw and what Daniel wrote was relevant to God's people back then. It also means that it's relevant for God's people now. And it means that this, what Daniel wrote, will be relevant for God's people in the future. Let me explain further using an illustration. Think of it as a mountain or a horizon involving several hilltops. So I got a picture. You see a horizon. There are several ridges, several horizons in view as we look at this mountain range, correct? Though we might choose to focus on one horizon, there are actually multiple ways to see this mountain range. So I, I, if you go back to, you can keep, leave that up please. If you go back to, to, to Mark 13, we studied that like two years ago. We looked at the Olivet Discourse, which was Jesus speaking of future things when he spoke to his apostles or his disciples. And we made the argument that there was multiple horizons in view there. When you and I are standing in, uh, let's say, outside of Eagle Point, and you're looking south, you see Roxy Ann. And then right behind Roxy Ann, you see Wagner Butte and Mount Ashland. And if you're beyond Eagle Point and you're looking in that direction, it looks like you're looking at one thing. Well, we all know that when we get in the valley, you have Roxy Ann on the east side of the valley and Wagner Butte on the west side of the valley, and there's actually a large space between the two mountains. When you're looking at it from the other angle, they look like they go together. But there's really two things happening here. Well, this transtemporal argument when it comes to apocalyptic literature would say that as we read some of these things in apocalyptic literature, there are actually multiple horizons in view. One or two or three things can be true at the same time as this literature collapses upon itself and these images can refer to multiple times in human history. So let's illustrate this real quick by using our text from last week. Last week we studied the verses on the four beasts. And, and we talked about how they corresponded to these four earthly kingdoms. Well, what's interesting though, is if you read the other apocalyptic book in the Bible, Revelation, at the end of the Bible, we see in Revelation 13, those same four beasts are mentioned but they're mentioned differently here. In, in Revelation written by the Apostle John, John picks up on all the imagery that we see in Daniel 7. But he picks it up in Revelation. And he mashes all of this imagery together and he describes it as manifesting in one earthly power. Some say that John is describing the power of Rome in, math, in, Roman, in Revelation 13 and Rome's hostility towards God's people at the time that John was writing. But I want you to listen real quick. If you have a Bible, you can turn there or you can just listen. To the description John uses in Revelation 13, verses 1 through 2, keep in mind the descriptions we had in Daniel 7. Here's what John writes. I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horn and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's. Its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. So we see the same imagery here in Revelation 13 as we do in Daniel 7. So John is looking back at Daniel's imagery, which is connected to four different kingdoms. And yet he sees it as connecting to a single power here, perhaps the Roman Empire, and the power Rome displayed against his own people. But ultimately... Could this imagery be connected to all world dominions that arise unto the end of the age? See, if a feature of apocalyptic literature is that it's transtemporal, it means that images and symbols that may apply, it means that images and symbols may apply to more than one period in history. In other words, God may have multiple horizons in view as he peeks, as he peels back the veil and reveals things to Daniel as he unveils the spiritual reality behind the physical world. And so, because this is a feature of apocalyptic literature, let's just be honest, it makes it very difficult to interpret. It requires humility. And as I think of these four men, or these three men that I studied, they're not all in agreement on how to interpret some of that. So we need to be humble here. We need to use discernment. We need to be cautious of being overly rigid. And if we do make interpretive decisions, which I think we ought and we should, we should hold views, we should hold them with humility. 
So all of that is a setup. I know that's a long setup. I'm sorry. We're going to get through the text very quick now to the three things I want to share with you about our passage today. Number one, here's the first thing I want you to know. Because it's relevant. That, these horizons is relevant in what we're going to learn here in a few minutes. First thing I want you to see is that court is convened. We see that court is convened. As the, as the beast is raging in verse 8, it's as if God pushes pause and then suddenly Daniel is transported in our text to this courtroom. And we've got to remember that symbolism and metaphor are features of apocalypse. And there's a lot of symbolism here in this divine courtroom that we see in verses 9 and 10. What's happening here? What is Daniel seeing? He's watching the throne room of God become a courtroom. And we're seeing that the rule of God over the world is now coming into view. And you know, as we go back to last week, as we read last week's text, we already kind of had this vision, that we had this understanding that God was sovereign even over these beasts. You remember there was an unseen voice that was, that was speaking and giving things authority, allowing this to unfold. There was unseen hands that were plucking eagle's wings out of these beasts. So we got the sense even last week that God himself was in control of what was transpiring, that God controls the very things that actively rise in opposition to him. But, but in these verses, in sh- verses 9 and 10, there's this, there's this distinct moment where we see God's reign unequivocally being established. And so Daniel looks, and what does he see? He sees the Ancient of Days. He sees that again in verse 13. Who is the Ancient of Days? You probably know. Ancient indicates that this seated one existed before time again. That word ancient of days, it literally means before days were. If you go to Isaiah 43, there's language in there where God says, I am from ancient of days. He says in the ESV that from henceforth I am he. And so in view here is the ancient of days is, is taking his throne, its creator God, who existed before even days were created. He, he has existed from everlasting to everlasting. He is the first and the last. And so Daniel is looking at God himself as he sees this vision. As this scene suddenly shifts from this boasting little horn, this boasting little beast, Daniel now sees the eternal God as he takes his seat upon his divine throne as the chief justice over all of the universe. And so the central focus here is this throne. It's the throne of the Ancient of Days. But we read of other thrones. The text begins by talking about, as I looked, thrones, plural, were placed. And there's no agreement on who is sitting on those thrones. It could be saints. It could be angels. What is clear, however, is that the court has convened. Thrones are set for saints or angels. And God himself, the Ancient of Days, with absolute rule, absolute dominion, absolute authority, he takes his throne as chief justice. And as Daniel's vision continues, as he's fixed on this Ancient of Days, his throne starts to come into focus. Not even, even before his throne, we see White clothing and hair that is white and as pure as wool. What does white clothing symbolize? Well, it symbolizes the absolute and infinite purity of God. Why is his hair white? It symbolizes the sovereign wisdom of the ancient of days. And he looks at this throne. It's engulfed with the divine fires of judgment. Wheels of fire like a flaming chariot throne. A raging river of fire flowing out from the throne, hunting down the wicked. I love what the ESV study Bible says about the, the scene that Daniel's watching. He's, they, they, they write, the scene depicts in powerful imagery a judge who has the wisdom to sort out right from wrong, the purity to persistently choose the right, and the power to enforce his judgments. All around this fiery throne and throughout this heavenly courtroom, are innumerable angelic beings ministering to the Ancient of Days, standing attentively before him in service of him. And here's this poor soul, Daniel, as God just peels back the veil and his mortal, finite, little man eyes behold this divine scene in HD 4K surround sound clarity. No wonder he was terrified. No wonder he had an anxious spirit and an alarmed mind. But God here is allowing Daniel to peer into his throne room, into his courtroom. And as his eyes, and as his eyes behold the courtroom of God, the evidence books are open. And judgment is rendered. And we as readers are reminded that our God is infinitely just. And nothing escapes his ever watchful eye. 
his mobile throne. His throne is mobile. It's got wheels of fire. I wrote in my notes, with wheels ablaze with the fires of judgment. And there is no king or kingdom on earth that cannot run the perfect justice of the ancient of days. Listen, nothing unjust will ever escape his judicial gaze. Nothing. No act of violence, no oppression, no tyranny, no injustice, no abuse will ever go unnoticed or unpunished by God. Ever. The books were opened, we read. I read this week that in Scripture, the books are symbolic of God's memory of the deeds, words, and thoughts of every person who has ever lived. I'm telling you, if you are oppressed, this is hope-giving. If you are living under an oppressive regime, let's say you're living in North Korea or Saudi Arabia or China, this is hope-giving. Oppressive, oppressive regimes, oppressive rulers, oppressive people get away with nothing. Full and final justice will one day take place. If you're oppressed, this is hope-giving. If you're an oppressor, this is fear-inducing, and it should be. You should see as this veil is peeled back and the fiery throne of God is poised to pour out judgment on the wicked. And if you are of the wicked, if you are not claimed in Christ, this should cause you to be afraid. Because one day the books will be open and God's fiery judgment will be poured out. But for the people of God who have an advocate in Jesus Christ, justice is assured. Secondly, we see that judgment is pronounced. After the court is convened, we see that judgment is pronounced. The button is unpaused. We go now from the, the, the bragging little minion on planet Earth, and now he's standing in the presence of the judge. No matter how tyrannical or oppressive or terrifying or authoritarian or abusive a beast can become, we're reminded in verse 11 that the divine reality is true. And the judgment facing the beast was assured. Look at verse 11. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that was still spewing out of this little horn. As I looked, Daniel writes, the beast was killed. His body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. With the courtroom set, we're back at the fourth beast. The little horn comes up among the other ten horns. This is all symbolism. The little horn with the big mouth is doing the same thing he's always done. Being terrifying and braggadocious. And we'll see in the verses we study next week, we'll become to understand more with more specificity what was the evil that this, this kingdom was doing, this beast was doing, this horn was doing. We'll, we'll come to understand that this mouthy one is a ruler who speaks out against God, oppresses the people of God, and comes up against the kingdom of God. And we'll unpack that next week. But halfway verse, through verse 11... As you may be thinking, oh man, this beast is going to have his way. This beast is going to keep raging. It looks like there may be no hope. And then bam, in an instant, the beast is destroyed. Daniel tells us in verse 11 that he watched as the beast was slain. And as part of the beast, the, the little horn too was utterly destroyed and burned to obliteration in the divine fires of judgment. The judgment of the Ancient of Days is pronounced and the tyrannical boastings and behavior of the fourth king and his kingdom are definitively put to an end in the fires of judgment that flow from God's heavenly throne. I read this week that if it were not so sad, actually this guy told me this, I read it, I should show you, every time I quote someone I should tell you who I'm quoting. Uh, this guy wrote, pretty smart guy, uh, don't agree with him on everything, but he's pretty smart. He said, if it were not so sad, the scene would be humorous. This little horn with a big mouth is spewing out venom toward the Almighty when suddenly the fire of God's judgment falls and the little horn is silenced forever. In my mind, I immediately go to all the tyrants throughout human history. The dictators, the fascists, the conquerors who oppressed the people of God. We'll spend time next week studying the interpretation of the text. There's tremendous implication. However, as we look at this vision of Daniel, we see that that, that if, it, if, if apocalypse is what we claim it is, if it's the, the spiritual reality behind earthly events, if this is God peeling back the veil, we're left with a question that we're, I'm gonna, uh, we, we're trying to answer here. Like, okay, if that's the case, who is this little arrogant horn with a big mouth in history? Who is this person? And you'll be shocked to know that this guy does not agree with this guy. And this guy doesn't agree with either one of them. Who is this third guy? We don't know. Maybe 
it's a good opportunity for us to throw up the horizons on the screen again. Maybe that little horn could be Antiochus Epiphanes, who was the ruler of the Greek Empire in the second century BC. He was a tyrant. He persecuted the Jews for terribly for three and a half years before rescue came in the form of Judas Maccabeus in around 160 BC. Maybe it's Antiochus Epiphanes that Daniel is seeing. Maybe it's Titus. That little horn could be Titus, this Roman general who overthrew Jerusalem in 70 AD and he, he mocked temple worship by offering up blasphemous worship in the temple itself. His stories are horrific, what took place in the fall of Jerusalem. Maybe that little horn is Titus. Or that little horn could be pointing forward to something that's yet future for us today. A future antichrist. Now that little horn could be just one of those. Or I think a better approach would say it, it's all three. And probably a few others that we haven't recognized ourselves. John tells us in 1 John chapter 2 that there will be many antichrists. Now there will be an ultimate little horn that wages war who the Apostle Paul calls the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians 2. But I think as we think about the whole of Scripture, as we think about the whole story of humankind, the beast is seen as waging war against the people of God since Genesis 3. The serpent beast slithers into the Garden of Eden and hisses his destructive lies into the man's ear and into the woman's ear. And throughout human history, we have seen, like a serpent in the water, we've seen that serpent, that beast, making himself known again and again and again throughout all epochs of human history. And one day we read in the scriptures, in Revelation 20, that that dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, will be thrown in the lake of fire. And so, so perhaps as we think about this in a trans-temporal way, perhaps all of these are in view, as Daniel's talking about this beast and the judgment that falls on this beast. And I know there's lots of opinions in here and and lots of different convictions when it comes to this text. This is just one, as we humbly talk about these scriptures, one option I'm, I'm, I'm proposing today. Now I think, of, I think of the first audience here to this book. I think of those Jews who were exiled for 70 years in Babylon. They were, they were exiled, living in a foreign land. They were told by God to, 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 to be at home in Babylon. To be, they, were, they were God's chosen. They were God's remnant, God's God's. God's people were sent into exile in Babylon, and we see that through the prophet Jeremiah's uh, words in Jeremiah 25 and 29. But I think about the first audience of Daniel's words. Now, we're reading it, what, 2,600 years after the fact. But I think about who are the first people to listen to, to hear Daniel's words, to, 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 to behold the visions that God had given him. And, and most scholars think it was the post-exilic Jews. It was these Jews who, after 70 years of exile, were allowed to go back. And, and the thought would have been among these, these Jews, like, hey, we endured the 70 years that we were told by Jeremiah, told by God through Jeremiah, we were going to endure. 70 years of exile, living in a foreign land. We were told about this. We were prepared for this. We were there to suffer. But now, as, as God is giving revelation to Daniel, it's not just the Babylonian empire that's going to oppress these people. They're realizing now through this divine vision, this apocalyptic vision, that there's going to be another kingdom that's going to come after the Babylonians, and it's going to oppress the people of God. And then there's going to be another kingdom, and then another kingdom. And, and they're, they're realizing that their suffering is going to be long. I read this week that the point not to be missed here is simply this. God wanted Daniel to know that God's ultimate victory over evil would be a long time coming. But no matter how long the wait, no matter how brutal the occupiers and oppressors were, there's also this hope embedded in this vision that God's ultimate victory is yet to come, albeit a long way off. And so perhaps Daniel here is coming to reality with are coming to terms with the reality that God's kingdom rule would not arrive after 70 years of Babylonian captivity. Daniel is being told by God through this vision and the people of God through Daniel that more ungodly kingdoms, kingdoms were to come and more ungodly kingdoms were going to waltz across the world stage. But it's not only for Daniel in the, the first audience. These are words God has preserved for us as well. This is for us today as well. I think as Christians, in this, where we find ourselves in this part of salvation history, we await the return of Christ. How many conversations have I had with the people in my church saying, I'm so ready for Jesus to come back. I'm so sick of the oppression, the brokenness, the sin, the debauchery, the nastiness of this world. Jesus come back and said it all right. I'm ready. Honestly, I'm ready. 
Come in today. I'm ready. We know what it is to, to wait. And in, 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 as we've said in the beginning of this series, in, even in the Western world, where we've got religious freedoms, we are beginning to sense the changing of winds across the face of the earth. We know what it is. And we will continually and increasingly know what it is to suffer and to face opposition. But our call is the same as their call. We're called to endure in faithfulness. As long as, as we have been called to live as exiles here on planet earth, as long as we're called to be at home here in Babylon as we await the consummation of the kingdom, we wait and long for Jesus to take us home. We do not give up on God's assured justice. His justice is assured and, and that's hopeful for us. And though the suffering may be long, it is absolutely assured that fire will fall from heaven and righteousness will prevail. The righteous judge, the ancient of days, God himself will destroy the beasts and justice is assured. Finally, after the court is convened, judgment is pronounced, we see the kingdom established in this vision. Verse, seven, or verse 13 in chapter 7, I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. Then he came to the ancient of days and he was presented before him. Again, you're going to be shocked to know <laughs> that none of these guys agree on how to interpret this verse. None of them. They're helpful. I, I read all of them. I feel kind of dumb when I read them because they use big words, but I have my thesaurus app up and it helps me. <laughs> But there's great debate concerning these three verses about who the Son of Man is, which I think is a lesser debate. The bigger debate is concerning when in salvation in history do the events we see here un actually unfold. That's, that's where there's really not agreement in the church. But here's, a, here's the thing. It's fine to disagree on that. We don't, it's, this, this, is, this is not a, a, a central issue that we should divide over. No, not even close. In fact, I would say it's probably even healthy for believers to, to debate these things and talk about these things with humility and the Bible open as we seek to understand the word of God. Because there's not universal agreement among the people of God. And people who love Jesus, love the gospel, are in the kingdom. They, they disagree on this. In Heritage, we recognize that. In fact, if you've taken our membership class, you have heard the, the language we have around how we kind of have an open-handed approach to eschatology. I'm throw, I think I can throw up on the screen. Here's what's in our membership language. Here at Heritage, we believe in the bodily return of Jesus to the earth, the resurrection of the dead, and the eternal judgment of the living and the dead before the judgment seat of Christ. We strongly believe in the second coming of Jesus and honor the differing views or convictions within the body of Christ on the issue of timing and sequence of last events. I'm so grateful we have that statement in our language. Because however we may choose to interpret these verses, this is not a reason to divide. And like Jeremy said on, on Thursday as we were going through the text, he's like, you know, this may seem passive. It's not passive. This may seem weak or noncommittal to have an open-handed approach to eschatology. But we really believe this is a sign of being committed to the values of Christ. I was talking to my small group on Thursday. We, we are always 10 days ahead of whatever's being preached here. So we studied the last verses 15 through 28 on Thursday. And we were, if I'm just honest, I, I know there's probably some guys in my group here, it was a little frustrating. It's like, because we're trying to understand the text. And it's like, and with this text, you just can't, you can't drive a stake in the ground because there's just not universal agreement. And we're wrestling, and we're wrestling, and we're wrestling. And I said, gosh, wouldn't it be great if there was just someone who had all the answers? Like a teacher I could just line up behind, turn my brain off, and say, just tell me what I'm supposed to believe, and I'll believe it. Dangerous. But there's plenty out there. There are plenty of teachers. You can go a thousand YouTube channels of guys that will tell you, oh, it's perfectly clear what's happening in Daniel 7. They're liars. It's not, and there's zero humility in that approach. It's not true. It's dangerous to line up behind someone who just tells you to turn your brain off and listen to what I say. We need to have the tools to wrestle with the scriptures and understand and be humble and open-handed with some of these disputed texts that all fit within orthodoxy. So who is the son of man? I, Again, I could walk through this from a bunch of different angles. Some people think it's Daniel himself. Some people think the Son of Man is the personification of the people of God or, or the, the Jewish nation. Some people think the Son of Man is maybe an angel. But I think if you look at, if you look at the larger biblical narrative, and if, we, if, our, if our hermeneutic or the way we approach this text is through the gospel, like I said last week, if we believe this, the interpretive center of Scripture is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, 
Well, then when you come to this text, it becomes pretty clear, pretty quick in my estimation, who the Son of Man is that Daniel sees and is talking about here in, in Daniel 7. I don't think it's a difficult connection to make. I think it's Jesus. If we go back to the recapitulated story, there was this stone that was cut from no human hand in Daniel 2 that was going to come in and obliterate the statue, or, and, and it was going to be blown away like chaff, and this, this stone cut from no human hand becomes a mountain that fills the whole world. Here we're seeing that that mountain is a man. That stone is a man. Daniel calls him the Son of Man. And the Son of Man, I believe, is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. It's not difficult to make that connection. Jesus, his favorite self-designation in the scriptures was Son of Man. Over 80 times he calls himself the Son of Man. In fact, at the climactic moment in Mark's gospel, as Jesus is standing before his accusers, it's like he kind of finally acknowledges what you've known that has been the case for 14 chapters. Jesus kind of finally acknowledges what he's been driving at through the whole gospel, that he is the Christ, the Son of God. But he doesn't stop there. If you go to Mark 14, you don't have to turn there, verses, 16 through six, verses 61 through 64, as Jesus is standing before the high priest and the chief priest who are plotting to kill him, the high priest looks to Jesus, they hate him, and they say, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus invokes the imagery of Daniel 7. I am, he says, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. It's a very purposeful allusion to the language of Daniel 7 here. Since Daniel's day in, into the time of Christ, Jews absolutely connected this language of Son of Man as, as a title to the Messiah referring to the king who would come and usher in God's kingdom. They knew exactly what Jesus was claiming. That's why they, they charged him with blasphemy and they killed him and buried him. And so Jesus very intentionally placed himself in Daniel 7 as the son of man. So I don't think that's super difficult to see. Daniel's helping us to see that Jesus accomplished something significant on the cross. He's helping us to see that it is, helping us see how it is through Jesus that the powers of the world were defeated forever. It's through Jesus and what he's done for us on the cross that he disarmed the powers and authorities of the world we read in Colossians 2. He triumphed over it by the cross. The resurrection is his victory. And we read in verse 14, or as Daniel says, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom to all people's nations, languages, that all people's languages and nations should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And there is, again, like I said a moment ago, there is great debate as to, 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 what, to when in salvation history is this taking place. Some people see the Son of Man coming on clouds as referring to the ascension of Christ that took place some 40 days after his resurrection where Jesus uh, ascended to the Father and established his kingdom as he took a seat at the right hand of the Father. Others, however, read these verses 13 and 14 as referring to the second coming of Jesus and the establishment of his future millennial reign. And these guys are in both camps. And depending on your take, it means that either these events that we read of in verses 13 and 14 are future to Daniel then and past for us today, if, it's, if we believe that this is the ascension that's in view, or if you believe that, the, that this is the second coming that's in view, then this is future to us as well. And again, the people who love Jesus very much disagree on that. But listen, we got to kind of take a step back and look at what's really being, what's the, what's the big idea here? Whether it's the ascension of Jesus in view here or the second coming of Jesus, ultimately what Daniel has in view is the victory of Jesus. The victory of Jesus over sin and death, over the kingdoms of this world. And we see that every kingdom, every nation, every language, every tongue will worship him. We see that language throughout all of the Bible. And we see that there is salvation that is assured for the people of God. There is a hope that is in view here that we can now have in the midst of struggle. This is not just a, a, a vision. This isn't just a night at the movies where we're watching, you know, something that was concocted in the mind of a man. This is the very revelation of God through Daniel to us. This is the reality of how it ends this is how the story ends. We don't need to listen to a thousand talking heads on YouTube. We know how the story ends, and we've been given the data to know how to live in the midst of a world that is broken and fallen. And I'm telling you, if you are someone who, I, I just think, you know, we are, we are so fortunate and blessed to live where we live, where we can freely worship. And this, this American experiment, as I heard another pastor say this week, is, is worth preserving. 
It's incredibly, we're incredibly blessed by the freedoms we have today. But listen, we all know oppression. We all know, we all know what it is to, ha- to suffer and to hurt and to ache and to wonder and to look to the heavens and say, God, how long? Whether you're suffering under the uh, tyrannical power of an authoritarian anti-God government, which at the end of the day, all governments are anti-God, or whether you're just living through circumstances of life that cause you to look to heaven and say, God, how long? Boy, we are told here that justice is assured and salvation is coming. I'm so looking forward to next week. The language in our text next week is so rich. Listen just real quick to, to how it is that, that, that this vision speaks to those of us that are in Christ. Those of us that have come to faith in Jesus, who've been forgiven by him through his sacrifice in our place on the cross. Those of us that have been adopted into the family of God. Those of us that are the people of God, or as the ESV calls us, the saints. Here's four times in the text, beginning with verse 14, we see what is in the future for those of us that are the people of God. All nations and peoples of every language will worship him, we read in verse 14. Verse 18, the holy people of the Most High, the saints, will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Verse 22, the ancient of days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High. And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. Verse 27, then the sovereignty power and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the most high. His salvation is coming. His coming kingdom will be given to the people of God and we shall possess it. So rest assured church as we read this text as we may debate the particulars and I invite the discussions I really do. We know one thing for sure that justice is assured because our God is a just God and salvation is coming for the people of God. Amen. We know how the game ends. Let's pray. Father, very thankful for this text, thankful for the ability to journey through it. God, and I know that there is so much, though this was a long teaching, God, I know there's so much that has been said and and could be said containing the the details of Daniel chapter 7. And so, God, I just ask that that you would allow us by your Holy Spirit to, to see the things you desire for us to see this morning, God. God, I pray that you would help us come to understand on a very deep, not just intellectually, God, but, but, but in a, a hope-inducing way, God, help us to come to see and understand and believe in this justice that is assured, that, that, that nothing escapes you. And God, help us to have great hope, no matter what season of life we may be in, we may be in today, that the salvation is coming and that, God, you have great rewards in store for your people. In fact, you tell us in the coming verses that You shall give us the very kingdom. Help us to understand that, God. At the end of the day, I pray right now that that we would just put our hope in you. God, as we engage with the kingdoms of this world and the little kingdoms we try to build in our little world, God, would you cause us to lift our eyes from these temporal, puny little things and fix our eyes on you, this ancient of days, with infinite wisdom and infinite purity, who has sent his son to die in our place to redeem us, that we might be in the family of God, in the kingdom of God. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.